I guess quite a few of you know me, but I'm Siobhan Wills, Director of the Transitional Justice Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Belfast campus, and really sorry about the chaos that it must seem to be. Um, and we're very pleased to co-host the event with the Equality Coalition. And the event is su supported by the Global Challenges Research Fund, the gender justice and security hub of that fund, and we're very grateful for their, that hub's support. And there's also they're going to support a net, another joint event with the Equality Coalition on the 15th of November, How Could Minority and Women's Rights Be Protected in a United Ireland? And hopefully all these technical issues that have happened today will not happen on the 15th of November. Um, a major theme of our work at Ulster is the importance of partnership, and it is especially pleasing to be working today with such really, truly valued and very patient uh, partners. The Gender Justice and Security Hub has been supporting work in the TJI, Queen's University Belfast, and the Committee on the Administration of Justice, um, one of the co-conveners of the Equality Coalition. And as part of that, Rory, who's on his way here, Finola, Finula Nielon and Lena Malagon interviewed members of civil society on the transformative potential of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and why that agreement has not been as transformational as many would have been hoped. But our focus today is not just respect, retrospective. We want to look at what a radically transformed future would look like. And we have a fantastic line of very patient speakers who will be offering their own reflections on the successes and challenges of Stormont, but more importantly, who have come together for a discussion on how to make Stormont functional and to realize advancements in the areas of human rights, gender equality, and social transformation. And I'm now going to hand you over to Patricia McEwen from Unison. Thank you very much, Siobhan, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia McEwen. I'm the Regional Secretary of Unison, the Public Service Union, and I'm co-convener of the Equality Coalition alongside my, my good colleague, Daniel Holder from CAJ. Uh, our coalition has its uh, genesis in the peace agreement. Uh, the nucleus of the coalition um, was formed around the same time, uh, based on the groups in civil society, particularly covered by the emerging um, statutory duty to promote equality of opportunity in the 90, 1998 Act. Um, today, the coalition has almost 100 civil society organizations um, organizations fighting for um, equality, sometimes on a single issue basis, um, and some of them, like the trade union movement, has the, the, the breadth of coverage of all of those disadvantaged categories in our society. Um, during the last period of the collapse of the executive and the assembly, um, way back, <laughs> Uh, the coalition developed a rights-based <coughs> manifesto. Um, we had campaigned, uh, uh, during every suspension, we had campaigned for the restoration of the executive. But this time round, we said, well, it's not just on any old basis. You know, we've really had enough. We want to see a, a, a devolution returned on a rights-based framework that will actually start to do what was promised in the peace agreement in the first instance. And um, I think that we would have been at that stage, may still be, the only organization that was um, using that kind of framework to explore, explore whether um, rights-based safeguards um, would give us some kind of sustainability in government for the future. And that's what we're centering on in this session today. Now, um, apart from the technical hiccups, uh, I have to say that I ha also um, want to give you an, an apology um, from Dr. Ann Smith. She got the call from the child's school a couple of hours ago, and you know we will all forgive her. Her child is sick. Um, Anne was going to uh, cover the role of the Bill of Rights, um, but that's also very fundamentally the work that the coalition has been doing too. So what I'm going to ask is that um, Daniel 
um, would maybe incorporate at least some element of that into the presentation he's going to make. So without further ado, I am very pleased to introduce um, my colleague and co-convener, Daniel Holder, the director of the CAJ, and as I've said, co-convener of the Equality Coalition. And Daniel's going to center on Stormont's um, vetoes, turning equality on its head, something which has preoccupied the coalition for quite some time. You're very welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a PowerPoint and it's this one. And I will work in a wee bit on the Bill of Rights as well. Do I have to press that and, oh, I don't want to edit it, do I? I just want to play it. Okay, here we go. Um, what I'm going to go through here is issues around the vetoes that are present in Stormont or should we say safeguards as they were originally envisaged and what's become of them over the last while. Um, I'm not actually going to, the, the obvious original focus wasn't to touch on either the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights or the Bill of Rights. Um, Bazam was going to pick up on that, but a few words on them. Obviously one of them was implemented, European Convention on Human Rights, Human Rights Act is in law. The Bill of Rights was meant to look very much like that, except it was meant to cover a whole series of additional rights. But what they both have in common because of those frameworks is all of those things are safeguards that are very objective. They're grounded in human rights law. They're not um, subject to sort of a subjective political interpretation um, that's limitless um, because they're grounded. You can't just make human rights up. They are grounded in objective standards. And that's the kind of inspiration originally when you look at the, the background to the Good Friday Agreement you can kind of think that's the kind of model it was looking at. And I put up the South African Bill of Rights because that at the time there was a lot of discussion about that really being a model that was drawn on essentially for the agreement. And, and we'll look at some of the, the issues around that. The agreement led to a number of other human rights treaties being signed up to too, or the European Convention um, on Regional Minority Languages, for example, uh, for the UK and the Framework Convention um, for the South. But what I want to look at really is to what extent to some, have some of the other vetoes, and I have a list of five there, some of the other safeguards or vetoes actually acted as sort of counter-majoritarian safeguards to get away from the position that the Good Friday Agreement was trying to get away from, where there was uh, a risk of one community dominating the other, or to what extent actually in practice has it worked out that they've resulted in maintaining the position of, of dominant groups, because you can look at very different models to the South African one. When I had a little bit of a look at it, and I don't want to stretch this, this isn't a comparison that would stretch beyond credibility, is say the, the, the Guardian Council of Iran, where you've got sort of six clerics and six jurists whose role is to maintain the status quo and also to ensure that the most religious, uh, conservative religious elements of ideology uh, end up being reflected in, in public policy. Now, let's see where we're at in terms of how our safeguards have operated. Um, you'll see we've put together written evidence that went to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee earlier in the year that links to other things. So a lot of what I'm going to say today, if you want a document with the details of it, is actually covered in that. First thing is, the Good Friday Agreement didn't actually set the institutions and all the rules around them completely in stone. There were various review mechanisms. There's the Intergovernmental Conference. It can't override the democratic arrangements set up under the Good Friday Agreement but it is to review them. The two governments are, are to review them. So the structures were never set into stone. And in fact, when you look further down the Good Friday Agreement, the sort of review procedures following implementation, and you look at paragraph seven of that in particular, if difficulties arise, well, yes, um, which require remedial action, well, yes, across the range of institutions or otherwise amendment of the agreement or relevant legislation, the process of review will fall to the two governments in consultation with the parties in the assembly. So it is envisaged that the two governments could actually review the institutions. And that could be well beyond the question of how you appoint first and deputy first minister, which was already changed, of course. Hey, Rory. Um, which was already changed, of course, at the times of the St. Andrews Agreement. Another thing happened at the St. Andrews Agreement where it was actually decided that there would be another committee to review the functioning of the institutions. And that was what became the Assembly and Executive Review Committee. The difference with that is not the two governments. It sits very much within the institutions. So the first one I'm going to go through is the one that many people will be familiar with. It is the Petition of Concern. 
So when you look at the Good Friday Agreement, it says that executive and legislative authority would be subject to safeguards to protect the rights and interests of all sides of the community. So it's grounded in, in, in rights and it's grounded in safeguards. And one of the key safeguards was meant to be the petition of concern. How is it meant to operate? Well, it was expressly supposed to be linked to equality requirements. That's what the agreement says. Every time a petition of concern was tabled, it was to trigger um, a special procedures committee, um, which was called the sort of ad hoc committee on equality and rights compliance or something like that, which would scrutinize whichever bit of legislation, the, uh, et cetera, that the petition had been tabled against, against what was in the European Convention of Human Rights and the Bill of Rights. So obviously that this mechanism to function properly needed the Bill of Rights to be in place. However, in practice, it was never properly put into place. It was never properly legislated for, and it just became a veto, whereby all that had to happen was 30 MLAs had to sign a bit of paper saying we want a petition of concern, giving no reasons, and that would trigger what's called the cross-community vote, which essentially turned out to be a nationalist unionist veto over the particular measure in question. And the use of the petition of concern to block equality and rights initiatives um, essentially brought it into, and for party political purposes, is what ultimately brought it into disrepute. I put up some detail from the detail and the link down below there about the mandate that ran between 2011 and 2016. If you look at previous mandates, so the 1998 to 2003 one, the petition of concern was actually only used seven times. Um, when you get to 2007, it picks up a bit. And this was a stage where it was used 33 times in that mandate. But when you actually get to 2011, it just exponentially rockets. Um, and you've over 100 uses of the petition of concern, 115 times, in fact. And far from it being a sort of minority rights veto, the party that, that, that represented the majority and the, the, the two dominant group, by far was the party tabling uh, the vast majority of these petitions of concern. And it, could, it had the numbers to actually do so on its own. Um, you can see the two nationalist parties, uh, both of them together, tabled the petition of concern 29 times, and others rarely used it. In terms of what it was tabled for, just to, you can see the list there, but just to single out three examples. Welfare reform bill by far tops the poll. It was used 49 times against by the DUP on 47 separate amendments to the welfare reform bill. Um, most notoriously, it was used five times to block marriage equality initiatives, i.e. directly used to block rights-based initiatives. And another thing, it was used three times, I think twice by the DUP, once by Sinn Féin, um, to block the censor of its own MLAs for breaking rules, so essentially for just a, a party political purpose. The whole problem this created led to numerous reviews of its operation. Um, the Assembly and Executive Review Committee reviewed it, came up with um, proposals that were then blocked. Um, there was again discussion about it being tied expressly to equality grounds. That was opposed by the DEP and did not progress. When you got to the Fresh Start Agreement and Stormont House, you ultimately ended up with a non-binding protocol on the use of the petition of concern that was then not put into place after the Fresh Start Agreement. In fact, you only really got reform of the petition of concern when you got to New Decade, New Approach in 2020 and the legislation that was tabled there, which made a number of reforms. The main ones being that it would be no longer possible for just one party to table a petition of concern, at least two parties were needed, that misconduct sanctions against ministers or MLAs was completely out of scope, so it could not be used for that purpose, and also that reasons must be given when tabling a petition of concern. However, NDNA also records that most parties wanted much broader reform and realized, I think, that the only way this would properly work as a safeguard is if you actually had objective criteria and an independent body adjudicating on petitions of concern, and that was going to be the Human Rights Commission. So did it breach the ECHR? Did it breach a Bill of Rights? Did it breach equality law? And then you'd actually have a rights-based safeguard. That said, even with those minimal reforms and the short mandate we just had of two years, it was only used once because its use had just become such into disrepute, it wasn't being used very often. And that was once and unsuccessfully because they didn't have the numbers by the DUP and TUV on the integrated education bill. But what also happened when the, bill of, when the petition of concern sort of dropped out of use is another veto 
that we are calling the St. Andrew's Veto, that's our name because it doesn't actually have a name, started to be used much more frequently and much more often. Called it St. Andrew's because this wasn't in the Good Friday Agreement. It didn't actually result from a process um, of the type described earlier on as to a formal reform with consent from parties. It was something brought in as part of the St. Andrew's Agreement as a deal, as a sort of DUP ask for them coming into the First Minister's office. Um, and it was ex its express purpose was to stop what they called ministerial solo runs, eh? that ministers could make decisions without the rest of the executive being on board. And the decision that was singled out as the reason was Martin McGuinness's decision to abolish the 11 plus. Didn't stop the 11 plus being abolished. It did stop something being put in its place, however, because it was then there. So what does this veto do? It changed the role of the Northern Ireland executive that already had a role in ministerial decisions that were cross-cutting across departments. But now what would happen is that most ministerial decisions, there's a few exceptions like quasi-judicial decisions of the Justice Minister post-2010, but that most ministerial decisions would require the support and a vote of the full executive if they were controversial or significant. Now, they're not objective human rights terms. They're quite woolly and subjective and elastic lay terms. Um, something in order to trigger this also had to be outside the program for government. But of course, we haven't had a program go for government for over a decade. Um, therefore, it means almost all decisions can fall under this and ministers are under a legal duty to refer any decision that may be controversial or significant um, to the full executive. Once it gets to the full executive, any three ministers, and that could include the first, the deputy f first minister, can actually trigger the vote in the executive to be taken on what's called a cross-community basis, which actually means unionist nationalist majority. Um, uh, and, and if not, the vote falls. The terms on tighter rights, as we said, and the actual use of this veto really is the tip of the iceberg. Because in a sense, lots of ministers, and we've met with ministers and said, we want you to do this. They've said, well, I would love to do that. I would agree with doing that, but I can't do it because I'd have to refer it to the full executive and they'd block it. So the actual use of this veto really is the, the tip of the iceberg. So we don't have the figures for the first mandate. It was used six times during the 2011-2016 mandate. It was used to block the Irish language bill. Irish language and Ulster Scott strategies, despite both being legal obligations and the courts then finding the executive acted unlawfully in doing that. Um, it was used for a few other things um, during that time. Um, it was only used once in the mandate of 2016, but that mandate only did last about a year. And what was it used for? It was to block a consultation on equal marriage. This veto is a bit different to the petition of the concern, because the petition of concern happens in the assembly chamber, which is in the full glare of the cameras in public, etc. The executive meets in secret. So no one really knew at this point that this was actually happening. It burst out into the public scene um, when the DUP vetoed in November 2020 um, Robin Swan's proposals to extend public health regulations to deal with the COVID pandemic. And then all hell broke loose. And we thought, because that was out in the public domain, we'd have an FOA ground to be able to FOA the last 10 years to see what else it had been used for. And it turned out in April 2020, it had been used on three occasions for three votes to block early medical abortion services. It had also been used to block an executive request to extend the Brexit transition period. Um, it should be noted as well that after 2022, when we didn't have an executive but still had ministers, that meant none of them could take any decision that was in any way significant or indeed controversial because there was no executive committee to refer it to. It really is a mechanism that can grind everything to a halt. There was a little bit of reform in one of the um, bits of legislation that excluded planning decisions from the scope because of controversy over them being vetoed, but it's still pretty much intact. And there's a fair bit of case law on this. It gets very complicated and you really realize it can get contradictory and almost become a bit of a wrecking charter. My favorite example is Edwin Putz's challenge to his own decision. He um, triggered a, what did he do? He asked for border checks to be stopped on the grounds that the minister who had authorized them had completely foolishly overstepped his powers, even though it was Edwin Putz himself. <laughs> Um, by bringing in the border checks in the first place, they were significant and controversial, should have been referred to the full executive. And the courts, having a sense of humor, found that in fact that was wrong, but his decision to stop them was significant and controversial and therefore he couldn't. Um, but it gives you a sense of how complicated this is. 
It also gives you a sense of how complicated this issue of designation is, because designation, of course, was used as a, um, as a safeguard. Um, that was the whole issue around cross-community votes, and the idea was the Good Friday Agreement had moved away from sort of the exceptionalist approach of, uh, of saying that there was no ethnic boundary. Of course, any ethnic boundary is artificial and, and, and flexible and vague and grey, but had moved towards the recognition you could be British or Irish at both, etc., uh, and, and various other indicators. That's, of course, still complex. We still don't have even an agreed name uh, if you look at uh, different community backgrounds. Um, but what effectively happened is the Good Friday Agreement required designation. It says identity. It doesn't actually say community background. It says identity, nationalist, unionist, or other. And that's the barometer used for cross-community votes. But what happens in practice is it's the first category. It's party political ideology that's the category, not an indicator of community background. Um, and that's been brought into sharp focus recently. Now, the growth of others is much bigger, and they don't have a vote, either in the St. Andrews Agreement or in the Petition of Concern. There's a number of other measures that could be used as alternatives to this. Some of them require changes to the Good Friday Agreement. Citizenship is one. Um, obviously, there's a lot of legal certainty over that. Which passport do you hold? That's pretty measurable. Um, but what happens if you hold two? You can't get two votes. Could you vote on both sides of a cross-community vote? Gets complicated. Um, national identity is another one, but that gets complicated because there's multiple identities. Uh, religion as an ethnic indicator, not as an indicator necessarily of religious belief, is routinely used in fair employment and in things like 50-50 recruitment to the PSNI, but again, has its own problems. Uh, community background, if that was just the indicator, unionist, nationalist, or other, you, you, you've legal certainty issues over that, and mixed heritage, but... I suppose the point is that at the moment it's actually party political ideology and indeed some of the changes to standing orders have embedded that. Um, when the Women's Coalition sort of redesignated legislation was passed to stop them from doing that again. Um, so you have a difficulty with that. I'm going to rattle through. I've completely lost track of time, but I know Anne's not here, so maybe I've got a wee bit more. Um, I'm going to rattle through a few other vetoes. One is what we've called the executive agenda veto, and this is part of the ministerial code whereby either the first or the, both the, deputy, the first and deputy first ministers must agree the agenda of the executive meeting. So in practice, what that means is either one can veto an item on the executive meeting, which means that no decision at all can be taken on that particular issue. We've numerous examples of this being used um, because ministers started to get annoyed after 2020 and started to say it publicly. In fact, they started to get members of their own parties to ask them questions in the assembly as to why they hadn't done something so that they could then say, well, I tried, but it was blocked from the executive agenda 20 times. Um, we've evidence from a Council of Europe report that the progress on duties towards the Irish language in Ulster Scots was blocked. Um, the judicial review that Conrad de Gallagher took against the failure to adopt the Irish Language Act revealed that uh, papers, in terms of progressing the adoption, a legal obligation, um, had been blocked for more than 30 meetings. Um, the finance minister at that time, I, I can't remember the figure, but had certainly said the budget was blocked at a, at a particular time. Legislation to, to close gaps in welfare legislation was blocked from the executive agenda 17 times. All of these, it, it appears, were by the DUP. Um, it would either be DUP or Sinn Féin. It appears all of them, though, were, were DUP. Um, the health minister and justice ministers made the same complaints, and the outcry actually led to some measure of resolution on these issues about opt-out opt out organ donation and, indeed, upskirting and abuse legislation. Um, Fresh Start had a few reforms. It was a problem back then, but it was non-binding, and nothing was ever implemented to, to change it. The other mechanism I wanted to go through that not as many people know about but as a mechanism at local councils, but it's still one of Solomon's safeguards because they legislated for it, is what's called the call-in mechanism. So under the Local Government Act, remember we used to have loads of councils and then they were down to 11, and that was in 2014, and this was the legislation they set up. And a lot of the talk around then was we need a safeguard, we need a minority right safeguard. And what we ended up with was something called call-in, whereby key decisions of a council could be called in by 50% of councillors. Then it's sent to a barrister or a lawyer who is to make a legal determination as to whether the key decision in question meets the threshold of call-in, which is, as well as some procedural issues, that it would be um, dis that the particular decision would disproportionately affect adversely a section of the inhabitants. And if the lawyer determines that that threshold has been met, 
um, then the decision has to be taken by a qualified majority of 80% of councillors. That's how that one works. Now, you'd think that that concept in law, which is a bit odd, disproportionately affect adversely, is a bit like adverse impact, which is an equality law. What does it mean? It means a form of discriminatory detriment, i.e. something objective and measurable. Um, this was to be given much greater legal certainty by secondary legislation, the title of which is there, which would have actually tied in the definition of that concept of disproportionately adverse effect, of whether it was interference in ECHR rights, or the Section 75 equality duty. Now, the punchline is, this was then blocked by a petition of concern. So the secondary legislation doesn't exist, meaning there's a lot less legal certainty over what that concept means. We're currently dealing one, we've taken um, the Information Commissioner, actually not Belfast City Council, to court, they're a notice party, over one that happened whereby a legal determination by the council after DUP called in determined that having to look at Irish alongside English on a sign constituted a disproportionate and adverse effect on a section of the community. Now, we're, we're keen to see the reasoning for that determination for obvious reasons, as it does seem to have flipped the entire purpose of, uh, of a equality safeguard, a minority rights safeguard, completely on its head. It's being used to block minority language rights. And finally, what happened to our equality impact assessments? Something we've looked at um, over the years um, with increased horror as to the way the duty has been interpreted. A way, this was a core safeguard of the Good Friday Agreement. It was legislated for by the famous Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. That was the statutory equality duty, whereby public authorities in assessing policy um, are to impact assess equality impacts on the, against that concept of adverse impact. A, does a particular policy constitute an adverse impact? A, a discriminatory detriment, something objectively measurable, using the case law on discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. Bit of sleight of hand, you'll not find the words good relations mentioned anywhere in the Good Friday Agreement, but they appear in the legislation when the NIO had, had written it. They added a good relations lemon. Um, a lot of people who were around at the time, Patricia was one of them, um, made sure that all hell broke loose over that particular edition. And <coughs> Mo Molam agreed not to remove it, but agreed actually to subordinate it to the equality duty on the face of the legislation. Unfortunately, that seems to have been ignored. Equally, in Britain, where the same concept is in law, the concept has developed as one that's about tackling racism, homophobia, sectarianism, etc. It's tackling prejudice and promoting understanding as, as the definition. Um, some other definitions the Quality Commissioner put out are promoting diversity in all its forms. All, all good stuff, this. Um, however, what we found in practice is sometimes just lay definitions of good relations end up being brought into policy i.e. what is politically contentious or what makes someone angry. Um, but the equality impact assessment duties, when you look at them in legislation, are only tied to the equality limb of the duty, not the good relations duty. So that should provide a bit of a safeguard. Now, someone thought it was a good idea to change that. In the TBUC uh, proposal, there was a proposal to change the legislation, so you'd have this concept of good relations impact assessments brought into existence. but. We all thought that was a terrible idea, and it didn't happen. It was defeated, wasn't taken forward, but that doesn't stop it from happening in practice. We have numerous examples in CAJ's unequal relations report, it's about 10 years old now, of the good relations be duty being used to veto over equality promoting policies in areas of economic, social, and cultural rights. But just to give you one contemporary example, there's a draft equality impact assessment by Belfast City Council, again on the theme of, of bilingual signage and leisure centers, uh, hardly, uh, which concludes, of course, on equality grounds that having to look at a sign is not a discriminatory detriment. That's a no-brainer, really. However, what does it do when you look at the text of it? It essentially completely departs from the statutory framework, ignores the fact there's no such thing as a good relations impact assessment and does one anyway. In fact, that's the predominant focus of this sort of 100-page long document. Departs from the definitions of good relations in the council's own equality scheme, substitutes them for a lay interpretation that there's an adverse impact on good relations if there's opposition and hostility to a policy, and it essentially um, concludes that the evidence to date indicates there is an adverse impact on good relations because the DUP and what are euphemistically called local residents are very angry about this policy, and therefore the equality duty is breached and consideration should be given to an alternative policy of monolingual signage. So essentially you're talking about what was supposed to be a safeguard 
on equality, turning into something that actually vetoes equality in minority rights measures. I'll leave it there. There's the rest of the, there's the list of vetoes we've looked at, and we'll leave it as an open question. Has the intention of the agreement actually just been completely flipped on its head? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Hear it and weep, then get angry, then do something about it. That's our obligation. Um, we're going to take some Q&As after the um, presentation from Anurag. And uh, that's straight into my introduction, Anurag Deb. It described as a PhD candidate in the School of Law at Queen's University, but I know there's an awful lot much more than that to you. <laughs> so you're very welcome. Come up and uh, talk to us about is the, is the judicial approach to the Northern Ireland Act compatible with the Good Friday Agreement. You're very welcome, Anna Ray. Thank you. Um, just... Now, I'm very glad of um, Daniel having gone through the detail of much of the post and Andrews provisions in the Northern Ireland Act, because that is my least favorite part of this presentation to go through, because it is just an avalanche of detail. And the audiences I've presented this to so far at that point usually fall asleep. Not that we fell asleep to yours. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, so my point, this is actually, this is based off of a paper that's currently hopefully being reviewed um, uh, for publication. But um, so if you have any feedback on this, it would be gratefully received um, and included in, in sort of rejigging the paper. The point of this, th this is was brought about by a, little known event, perhaps, the May 2022 elections, uh, where Sir Jeffrey Donaldson lost and um, Sinn Féin became the largest party in the assembly. Um, tied to this, of course, is the protocol and ultimately resulting in the uh, stormed assembly being empty. Now, the point here is that I want to look at what is the Stormont Executive. I'm not going to spend too long on this because Daniel actually very usefully covered all of this so we can get to the bits that I like about this presentation, um, which is comparing the Stormont Executive to other governments in the UK and seeing that as a basis for arguing that the courts should not treat the executive like other governments in the UK. They do. But they shouldn't, because we, and I, th this is the, the framing of the whole thing, Stormont was not made in the image of Westminster. It should not be treated like Westminster. So, the executive committee. <clears throat> um, Daniel described it as a cabinet. I disagree. It is, I don't think it is a cabinet. I think it's uh, not a cabinet because it's, it's not an executive body. The executive committee is actually a committee of the assembly. And like any other committee in the assembly, it too has the power to call up witnesses and take evidence. The Scottish government, which is a cabinet, the UK government, which is a cabinet, the Welsh government, which is a cabinet, none of them have this power. Individual departments in the executive also have their own distinct legal personalities. They are different decision makers. They can be sued in their own right compared to their minister. That does not happen in Britain. If you sue the Department of Health in the UK, you're not suing the Department of Health, you're suing the Secretary of State for Health. The department is an extension of the Secretary of State. The department steps in the shoes of the Secretary. The Department of Health here doesn't have to. It is under the direction and control of its minister at all times, but it is nevertheless a separate legal entity, um, which is what led to Buick, for those of you who remember. Now, the mode of appointment, this is the first point of difference. And the FMDFM, uh, of course, the largest of the largest, uh, the largest party of the largest designation in the assembly uh, gets to select or nominate the first minister candidate. The largest um, party of the second largest designation gets to uh, nominate the deputy first minister candidate. 
The Justice Minister is appointed by resolution of the um, First and Deputy First Ministers and parallel consent by the Assembly. All other ministers are appointed by de Hunt. This entitlement by statute marks the, one of the most important differences between Stormont and, say, Whitehall or Holyrood or Cardiff Bay. There, if you have a coalition government, it is a coalition of the willing. Ours is more frequently than not a coalition of the bickering. It is a statutory right to hold ministerial office depending on your seat strength in the assembly. It is not political patronage. It is not ideological alignment. Um, and in, of course, as Daniel very helpfully set out in terms of the use of the storm and veto, or the um, executive veto, sorry, it is definitely not ideological alignment in places. So rival parties have to work together. There's no political patronage and there's no collective responsibility. The Scottish Parliament can fire the government collectively. The UK Parliament can fire the UK Cabinet collectively. The Assembly can't. It can withdraw its confidence in an individual minister, it can censure an individual minister, it can sanction an individual minister, but the executive as a whole? No. Checks on executive decision making. Now I'm going to focus predominantly on the legal stuff because the political stuff needs an assembly and we, well, don't have one at the minute. So it's a bit irrelevant. Um, the legal checks on executive decision making, this is really where the Northern Ireland Act is unique in one of the most legalized constitutional settlements in the UK today. Uh, it, it really sort of goes against the grain of the traditional Westminster understanding of a constitution, which is it's a political constitution. We have a very legalized constitution. Why? The ministerial code at Stormont is justiciable. You can sue a minister for having breached the code. The equivalent codes in Britain are not justiciable. There's a duty to act collectively via the executive committee, the significant controversial um, category of decisions which Daniel um, detailed earlier. There's no executive authority to do solo runs. Again, Daniel detailed that earlier as a result of the St. Andrews reforms. And there's a requirement to affirm the Pledge of Office. This is also a legal requirement to affirm the Pledge of Office, which includes a duty to act in good faith at all times. Um, when I presented this at a conference in Oxford earlier this year to a room full of mostly uh, English and Welsh um, constitutional scholars, and I said that the duty to affirm uh, the Pledge of Office includes a duty of good faith that by itself uh, could be justiciable, there was a collective gasp in the room. So, general principles of judicial review, of course, apply to ministers, legality, rationality, procedural fairness, etc. The consequences. The executive is politically weak by, by design. It's disunified, its decision-making is infrequently collective, and there's no collective responsibility. And we know it's disunified because we have the freedom of information requests to back it up. The executive is legally weak. There's a justiciable ministerial code. If you, as a minister, fail to bring significant controversial cross-cutting decisions to the executive committee, you are statutorily deprived of the authority to act at all. That doesn't happen in other governments. And the executive has less freedom and I'm going to explain in a second what that means, than the UK, Scottish, and Welsh governments. Freedom relates to ministerial maneuverability. If you're going to stand for election hoping to get into government, you're going to make a lot of promises. And when in government, you're going to try your hardest, hopefully, to fulfill those promises. That involves a level of political maneuverability that exists at Whitehall, that exists at Holyrood, that exists at Cardiff Bay. It exists far less in Stormont because the design of the Northern Ireland Act means that the courts can reach into the substance of ministerial decision making in a way that would shock most courts across the water. And yet, our courts seem to not understand that. Now, there are two cases that I want to contrast. De Bruyne McGuinness was at the start of uh, the devolution settlement way back in 2001. 
It was decided in the High Court by the then Mr. Justice Kerr, Brian Kerr, the late Lord Kerr, um, in the uh, High Court as he was at the time. So um, the First Minister refused to nominate Sinn Féin ministers to attend the North-South Ministerial Council uh, in order to persuade Sinn Féin to exert whatever influence it had over the decommissioning of weaponry by the provisional IRA. The judge declares this unlawful because the actual factor, decommissioning of weaponry, was uh, not a legitimate consideration in order to nominate ministers to attend the North-South body. But he also provides guidance on the future lawful exercise of power. What he actually says is, you can't consider decommissioning. But what you can consider is whether a minister is actively trying to undermine the Good Friday Agreement. So as First or Deputy First Minister, if one of your ministerial colleagues is acting in such a way to undermine the substance of the Good Friday Agreement, you may very lawfully refuse to nominate them in terms of the North-South body. And that is a legitimate political consideration, and the court will not look behind that. The point of this is the whole purpose of the devolution settlement goes back to the Good Friday Agreement. I want to contrast that with uh, the Napier case, which was decided two years ago, uh, almost two years ago, December. Um, this was in relation to the uh, boycott of the North-South Ministerial Council over the protocol. So the um, DUP at the time set out their policy to uh, withdraw from the Strand II institutions, i.e. the North-South Ministerial Council, um, and this was challenged. This was challenged by Sean Napier. The court held that it was unlawful. I mean, in the first instance, because the, um, the respondent in this case turned up and accepted that it was unlawful. And the judge ultimately severely criticized, this was uh, Mr. Justice Schofield in the High Court, severely criticized this wrecking or spoiling tactic. It declares a failure to attend the North-South Ministerial Council, failure to agree an agenda um, as unlawful. Now, the failure to agree an agenda is, is an interesting, because Napier came back to the High Court on this point. After the uh, First Minister at the time had accepted responsibility that this was unlawful, it came back and he said, well, this is what happened. There was no duty to agree an agenda for the North-South Ministerial Council because we didn't set one. So there, there was no unlawful breach because we didn't have an agenda to agree in the first place. Um, that didn't go down very well. Uh, so, but the judge here considers that the action is essentially political um, and is part of a myriad of political matters which inform actions. He declines any other relief than simply declaring it unlawful. He says, yes, I understand that this breaches um, the Pledge of Office, duty of acting in good faith. Um, I understand that this has ramifications for the compliance with the substance, the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement, but I'm unable to do anything because it's political. And I want to contrast these two cases with reference to arguably the most uh, weighty case under the devolution settlement, which is Robinson. This was the election of uh, the First and Deputy First Ministers back in 2002. This happened one day outside of a six-week timescale. Um, and so it was challenged as being unlawful. And the High Court said it was not unlawful. It was, it was lawful to have the election of the First and Deputy First Ministers outside of six weeks. Uh, the Court of Appeal said, no, this was unlawful. And the House of Lords disagreed. Why? Because the Northern Ireland Act, the House of Lords said, was in effect a constitution which has two main purposes, to implement the Good Friday Agreement, and a central tenet of the Good Friday Agreement is participation by the unionist and nationalist communities in shared political institutions. Participation. The point of allowing a flexible approach to a strict statutory timescale was to ensure that the institutions do not collapse. So, what does this show us? I call this a realist approach. Now, legal realism is a, an analytical tool within, within legal philosophy that 
acknowledges that the interpretation of law reflects the sociopolitical context in which uh, that law must operate. It's a very simplistic definition. Um, it's, it's about a century or so old, the philosophy of realism, but um, I don't have enough time to get into the detail of it. Anyway, um, the point is law is not neutral under this analytical paradigm. It is not neutral in relation to social reality. It exists as a social phenomenon, and it has to take account of the social reality in which it functions. The point is that judges exercise a choice when interpreting the law to give it effect in a way which furthers a particular end. Now, this is where traditionally legal realism encounters difficulty, because who gets to decide what that end should be? One might argue that judges deciding a, a, an end or a purpose of law um, in terms of an external morally desirable end might be arbitrary. But we know from the long title of the Northern Ireland Act that its purpose is to implement the Good Friday Agreement. So if you wanted a textualist interpretation, you have it. The Act tells you its purpose is to implement the Good Friday Agreement. The choice is to move beyond the formal language of the law in order to look at its operational circumstances as a major basis for interpretation. So, if we apply this to Napier and the DUP boycott, I say that we can anchor this into three main points. There's a duty to take part in the North-South Council. That is absolute. There's no exceptions to it. Uh, there's a duty to discharge all ministerial functions in good faith, according to the Pledge of Office, which, of course, you have to affirm in order to be a minister. And the interdependent nature of the three strands of the Good Friday Agreement. You have strand one, the devolved institutions, strand two, the north-south bodies, and strand three, the east-west bodies. If one fails, all of them suffer. The North-South Ministerial Council has been unable to meet fully since, I think, November 2021. Uh, the British Irish um, Council has been unable to meet fully. The British Irish in Intergovernmental Conference has met, but all of the strands of the Good Friday Agreement, all of the institutions envisioned in the Good Friday Agreement, have suffered as a result of the boycott. Is this judicial government? Now, th this is mainly for, for skeptics of judicial power, uh, skeptics of, of courts, which is a legitimate very valid skepticism to have. Um, I say it is not judicial government for two main reasons. The jurisdiction of the courts to intervene in executive decision making is a corollary of the design of the executive itself. The reason why courts don't like to intervene in governmental decision making at Whitehall, say for example, is because the design of Whitehall is a political evolution over centuries. It's not prescribed anywhere that this is what cabinet looks like. This is how the ministers make decisions. By contrast, we have a specific statutory design for the stormed executive. Simply speaking, if you don't want courts to interpret language, don't put it in a statute. If it's in a statute, it's going to be interpreted by the courts at some stage or another. And second, and more importantly, this jurisdiction exists to prevent politics from breaching the requirements of the law. Now, this is something that arguably may be possible, uh, depending on your conception of the rule of law, arguably may be possible in Britain, but it is far less possible here. Because the executive, yes, it is an elected body or comprised of elected officials, but it must operate within harder rule of law constraints and explicit statutory uh, boundaries that other governments do not operate under. Now, why this is relevant for the purposes of discussing rights is in order to, if you like, realize the potential that this sort of legalized decision-making can unlock you have to have an approach that is grounded in rights, not just in the politics, but also in the courts, when invariably, or hopefully not invariably, the politics fails, or the politics tries to second guess the duties it has under law. And my point here is to say that 
the courts increasingly look at the Stormont executive as any other government in the UK. It shouldn't. We did not vote to have a mirror image of Whitehall sitting at Stormont. We did at one point between 1922 and 1972. The design today is not reflective of the design of that time. We need to acknowledge that, and that acknowledgement needs to come through substantively in the way the courts deal with executive decision making, especially when it collapses. So, um, that I think is, yeah, I, just, I think I just summarized the slide. Um, it tailors relief towards remedying failures and deficiencies in a way that furthers the Good Friday Agreement. So it is, if you go back to the decisions and the reasoning of uh, Mr. Justice Kerr in the DeBrenna McGuinness decision, um, he was concerned with trying to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement remains stable and that the Stormont Executive, in whatever way it functions, it functions always from the starting point of compliance with the Good Friday Agreement. And so relief has to be future facing. It's fine for a court to say what you've done is unlawful, but if you just stop at that, then it becomes a problem. I mean, if you consider Napier, for example, Napier resulted in two declarations of unlawful decision making, and then the executive collapsed, and the courts are somehow unable to um, remedy or at least go some way towards remedying the possibility of collapse. So there has to be future-facing relief. The future-facing relief is important because derailment may have been thought of as exceptional at one point, but it's not exceptional anymore. We have had one executive in the past, what, six years? that only lasted between 2020 and 2022. So derailment has become a periodic occurrence. It has become a way of giving effect to a particular political strategy. Whether or not that is a good idea, I say it is a problematic point to keep collapsing governance and that the courts have to do something about that. Um, and in order to find something, you look to the design of the Northern Ireland Act itself. So, thank you for listening. joining us for that. I thought they were sticking you with the job. <laughs> okay. Um, listen, we've caught up very well on our exceedingly late start, so um, you will get a tea break in a minute, but this is a good opportunity. A um, lot of thought-provoking stuff there, so who would like to indicate first question? generally by a journalist and that's that was how we were finding out about all the delays that were happening you know so I suppose it's that sense of what's the responsibility of the government minister to declare okay. when the videos are being used because he wasn't actually doing that unless he was prompted to. I'm not sure how the um, we, mics are working we, here, yeah, so I mean, I've, got, I've got a big mouth, so I know you can hear me. But <laughs> we, tr we tried to find out, when we FOI'd, we tried to find out who'd voted which way, and that was actually quite difficult to do, 
Um, I'm trying to remember how the information originally uh, ultimately came out, but it transpired that um, I think I've got this right. If I've got it wrong, I will correct the record, but I think Robin Swan didn't actually vote for his own proposal. Um, he abstained. Mm. And um, the DUP, as we know, voted against it, which is what sank it. it, 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 it only their votes could, could sink it. They had the power to sink stuff um, themselves. Um, Naomi Long, of course, didn't vote at all, but couldn't vote in a cross-community vote, because it's, it's, it's only nationalist and unionist votes counted. And the nationalist parties, I'm trying to remember who voted. Nicola Mallon maybe did vote, voted against or in favour, uh, or do we not know? I think she abstained. Abstained. She abstained. So it's so so again you've got it because it's within an an anorex, right? Legally, it's not a cabinet as such. That's just a sort of description because the assembly and executive often get confused. But you've got essentially this this veto operating, but it's operating behind closed doors, and it's extremely difficult to find out unless people admit it or other people say it actually who voted which way. So in that sense, it's kind of a secret veto. Yeah. And on this occasion, it's a secret veto on a rights issue mm -hmm. that's totally clear because of CEDAW and everything else. Yeah. I, I'm just going to follow up on that, but mind in respect of the welfare reform blockages. So it was Deirdre Hardy that came out and said that it's been blocked 17 times using the executive veto. But then how did it happen that when there was no executive Deirdre Hardy was effectively able to pass the extension to the benefit cap, which was one of the mitigations, and to indefinitely extend the bedroom tax. She was able to do that in 2022 when there was no executive committee. So, well, how? how? <laughs> so, the, the 17 thing, remember, wasn't the St Andrews veto, it's the agenda veto. Yes. Whereby the first or deputy yes, first minister can veto it, items from yeah. the. I think what happened in that era, and it wasn't just that. If you remember when the executive collapsed, but the assembly was still there, quite a lot of things We're actually passed. got through. Yeah. And I think, it, and this is where you really get the complexities of the St Andrews Agreement. I think there was a lot of political chancing of the arm, I'll because they thought, it. "We'll just do this," and the only way that it can be stopped is if someone legally challenges it. Okay. But politically, it won't be legal. It won't be tenable for someone to be seen to be doing that and someone to be blocking that in the current climate. So we'll just get away with it. And that's that's the problem with the whole way this significant and controversial veto operates. It, it actually makes governance impossible, particularly when there's no program for government, which there hasn't been because it was vetoed as well for so long. It makes government impossible, so ministers sometimes just chance their arm, but they'd be extremely vulnerable if anyone challenged them. Because they, they'd clear, it, it's very difficult to think of a, a decision a minister could make that's insignificant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, in some way, it's always going to fall. There is a bit of case law on this about what that means. So, uh, uh, um, I mean, one of the judges says, well, it's not legally controversial this particular measure, because it was actually required by a legal obligation, I'm trying to remember which one that, that was, um, but would that be interpreted as politically controversial? It's just very difficult to see how this could operate in any coherent way, ever. Do any of our other panel members want to come in on that, or are you content? Hmm? Um, well, maybe yeah, I'll yeah, just sure, say... I won't come in specifically on that, but I did just want to flag up something from Anne Smith's presentation. Uh, Anne, as you know, couldn't make it at the last moment, uh, but she did send through her presentation, and I think it's important to highlight uh, a positive aspect of what she was suggesting a Bill of Rights could do. Um, of course, we don't have a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, uh, but one of the items of a Bill of Rights is that it can act as a means of uh, prompting, supporting, promoting political activity to protect rights and can give directions uh, to how politicians can think about rights. Sometimes lawyers have a tendency to think of rights as something for judges and uh, politics as being an unprincipled mass that politicians do. Uh, but a human rights culture, as Anne's work and others' work shows us, uh, indicates that Politicians can sometimes act in a principled way uh, and can do that if they take into account the idea of a rights culture. 
Uh, and our Bill of Rights could have done that for us, could have acted as a motor to um, promote progressive change, uh, as to counteract the risks of all the different vetoes and the elaborate structures that Daniel and Anurag have described. And it's not an entirely fanciful notion. We can look at Scotland, where the Scottish Parliament has taken on, into account principles in its legislation, including in its social security legislation that was influenced by work of our social justice colleagues here in Ulster, uh, but also uh, uh, pa tried to pass legislation to provide for better human rights protection in Scotland, of course, which got into trouble in the Supreme Court, but is now looking again at trying to embed human rights protections. You can look at Wales, uh, which is legislated to give protection to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You can look at the United Kingdom, where the Joint Committee on Human Rights has been doing lots of work to try and promote a rights culture with in Parliament, not always successfully, uh, but nevertheless trying to promote a rights culture. Uh, and you can look at the experience in the Republic of Ireland uh, where you know, big issues, which have been controversial in uh, the South, uh, have been subject to principle-based deliberative politics through citizens' assemblies and have come up with principled proposals for ways forward on things that uh, have traditionally been thought to be deeply controversial in that society. Uh, so a rights framework, a bill of rights, could offer uh, that potential f to support a rights culture in Northern Ireland as elsewhere in these islands. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, yes, please, Javon. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate Rory on speaking so with such clarity after having not slept for a <laughs> for 24 hours or something. <laughs> um, I, Daniel, your tour de force was totally fascinating. I had no idea that the petition of concern, when it first started, started out, I think it's called the petition of concern, mm -hmm. the first one, uh, was specifically linked to concerns over verifiable aspects of human rights, basically human rights and equality. Um, and it seems from I, I couldn't follow all of the steps with the, um, but it, it has evolved into something quite loose and, and, and nothing to do with the original, uh, well, very little to do with the original idea of the petition of concern. And my qu question is, uh, a very basic one is, how can we get back to there? I mean, if it's there and that's in, in the agreement, how come we're stuck with um, Think you're going to have to yeah. come to here. Yeah. I suppose very quickly, just to go back to that slide, there are review mechanisms under the Good Friday Agreement, so it would take, this could be done. I mean, you'd need to put the Bill of Rights in place for the petition of consent to function properly. You'd also need to legislate for the petition of consent as was originally intended. All that that would take would be political will of a British government at Westminster. It's their duty to do it. Yeah. They just won't. So it would be Westminster that would... It would have to be Westminster legislation to amend the Northern Ireland Act and um, and amend the sort of framework for standing orders um, so that the petition of concern would function as it was originally intended and obviously then Westminster legislation for the Bill of Rights. So it could be done. That wouldn't even take a review of the agreement because it was already in the agreement. Yeah. Okay. And also it's a source of very deep frustration to the civil society organisations in the Equality Coalition who will probably be the best versed in that uh, horrendous catalogue of, of blocking yeah. ta uh, tactics used over the, the number of years because so many of those organisations, their, their rationale um, to promote social and economic rights has been blocked using these mechanisms. So um, we do believe that it's doable. Right at the back there. Hello. Yes, um, uh, yeah, you first, at the, right at the window. Yeah. I'm sorry, you're in so, silhouette. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a reference uh, multiple times that obviously there is 20% of women which cannot participate within um, votes that really, as we say, control the agenda of politics in Northern Ireland. So if it was possible, in your opinion, do you think Or would that sort of distract from the 
they are actually which is that these systems are actually in place to start off with that we can trust each other to govern side by side. Thank you. Who wants to have a go? Anurag? Yeah, come on ahead. Um, I think, well, I, I'm i not entirely convinced one way or another that the uh, reform of the veto system is, I, I, I don't think we've, we, we have crystallized enough of sort of public and, and legal opinion on what kind of reform to the veto system would work. Which brings me, I think, to a significant issue that um, always seems to arise whenever the Northern Ireland Act is amended, and it's been amended so many times since it was first enacted in 1998. When it was enacted in 1998, uh, the impetus to enact it, as well as some of the key provisions in it, came from the Good Friday Agreement. That agreement was democratically voted through and involved a very wide spectrum of um, stakeholders. But since then, the democratic input into amending the constitution of this place has suffered considerably. And the most recent reforms to the Petition of Concern, for example, uh, the NDNA didn't say it should be done either at Westminster or by statute. It said it needs to be done, and it wanted to go, as Daniel said, much wider than the reforms that were done. But for some reason, the Northern Ireland office decided it was just going to legislate. Um, in fact, the, the bill itself that became the Minister's Elections and Petitions of Concern um, Act 2022 originally began as a way of stopping Stormont from collapsing altogether uh, and keeping it going, albeit in a kind of truncated state, um, and then became this kind of hodgepodge, you know, we'll just throw this in and this in and this in and amend the Northern Ireland Act to ensure. And so this sort of piecemeal approach, I think, always raises a fundamental question. Why is it that when we talk about constitutional reform or governance reform or better government in this place, why is it that we don't have a holistic conversation ensuring maximum democratic input? Um, instead, we have these sort of, you know, sticking plaster kind of fixes from time to time. And I think one model that we haven't considered that we may consider is the increasing use of citizens' assemblies in the South whenever you talk of constitutional amendments. Um, it's not a universally popular model by any means, but I think it increases the democratic legitimacy of whatever it is you want to amend in the Constitution. You know, the, the um, liberalization of abortion in the Irish Constitution has not diminished the criticism uh, or the, if you like, conservative side of society there, but it has sort of put paid to any idea that this was an anti-democratic amendment. The same goes with same-sex marriage. Um, I mean, whether putting minority rights into a majoritarian voting process is a good idea is another question. But um, there is no doubt that these were democratically done processes. So I think we need to have, yes, we do need to have a conversation about veto reform. But we need to have a very sort of wide, a conversation in terms of wide participation. And, and genuine engagement with, with people in order to then come in a position that can then be translated into legislation. Okay. Um, quick. Um, well, we're uh, very quick because I'm about to call a break. Very quick, just on the, just the, I don't know the other questions, but just on the just on the specific question, I think there are three options. Um, one is you change the uh, through the review process and everything, you change the designation system. To, to something else, maybe that more reflects community background or citizenship or something like that. That was the option that was up in the slide. Now, that has its own problems completely. That's option one. Option two would be you'd get rid of it completely. Um, now, if you get rid of it completely, 
Does that remove an essential safeguard and what do you replace it with? Well, you could just replace it with a Bill of Rights, which has a sort of objective criteria for safeguards. Would that prevent, say, a majority in the Assembly rolling back something that wasn't expressly covered by the Bill of Rights, like, for example, policing accountability? If there was a majority against that, would it allow the agreement to be unpicked? Maybe we're past that. Maybe there wouldn't be a majority um, against that. So that's the, the second one. But there is a third option, which involves no change in the actual legislative framework. But would in, and again, all of these things are complex and problematic. But it would, it would involve the parties not designating them, deciding themselves, particularly the parties, specifically the parties who designated as other, designating on the basis of community background rather than party political ideology. And then they would get votes in those cross-community votes. Um, all of these things are, are complicated and problematic. But that's probably the three, the three options. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. I am going to call a break now. Uh, I know uh, some of you still have questions or comments, but I rather suspect that in the next section you're going to have the opportunity to address those. So thank you very much to our panellists this morning. and Delighted that Rory made it with us. Everyone, um, can we reconvene so that we can have... Uh, a second panel of fascinating speakers this afternoon, and I think uh, topics that will certainly provoke lots of discussion and questions, uh, so very much looking forward to this. Uh, we'll have three speakers. So our first speaker is Emma Campbell, who is a research associate in social studies here at Ulster University on the cross-border funded North-South Reproductive Citizenship Project. And her PhD is on utilizing art, primarily photography and performance, as a tool for abortion rights, along with Alliance for Choice, of whom she is a co-convener. Emma is also a member of the Turner Prize-winning RA Collective, and her individual practice is embedded in queer and feminist art and activism. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing Emma's presentation and the ensuing discussion. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, multiple computers just to keep myself right. So um, controlling bodies with bureaucracy um, is really born out of uh, my experience as the co-convener of Alliance for Choice, where um, we still and I still actively take calls every single day from people who need access to abortion in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, a lot of what we encounter in their difficulties in access is because um, the human body doesn't know about legal time cutoffs and doesn't know about um, having to be very black and white in the description of the law. Um, first of all, where are we now? So um, how have we got here? Um, for those who don't know, I'll very quickly go over this. Um, but we uh, got the CEDAW inquiry written into uh, legislation. So there was an inquiry in 2016 called for um, by ourselves and two other um, civil society groups where there was an investigation on the lack of access to, in abortion in Northern Ireland. Um, really significantly as part of that process, they found that Westminster was always going to be the state holder or the stakeholder for our rights as the state that signed up to the UN CEDAW agreements, whether we had a function devolved government or not. But what made that easier to argue for in Westminster to change the law was that we didn't even have a functioning assembly at the time. Um, so unlike uh, the England and Wales, who still have a law that criminalises abortion in quite a few circumstances. Um, their law is essentially an exception case to the law that prevents abortion. We now have no um, primary legislation that criminalises any aspect of abortion um, up until 28 weeks. Um, we have one of the best laws in the world now, and unfortunately that isn't matched by access. Um, and cleverly, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland was given a lot of the duty and obligation in that law, I guess because we knew, um, and the people we were working with knew, that there, it, was, it was very likely that Stormont might not be functioning for much of this being enacted. Um, a week ago, Safe Access Zones 
actually got implemented. They came into law months ago, but they actually got implemented about a week ago. Unfortunately, there have already been two arrests, but um, it's uh, a piece of legislation that was part of that um, CEDAW uh, requirement, as was um, relationship and sex education, which we will come on to in a moment. But it's, as far as we know, it's the only place in the world where a piece um, of the CEDAW recommendations or a piece, piece of CEDAW requirements has been put verbatim into the law. Um, what are the issues? What's the bad news? Um, well, first of all, a couple of days after this law was passed, there was a protest called the darkest day in Northern Ireland. Um, about abortion coming into effect essentially in Northern Ireland and after decades of conflict that many of us in this room have lived through it seemed a bit rich that that was being called the darkest day in Northern Ireland um, but the biggest problem for me and for many people who were working on this was that Robin Swan our health minister attended that protest um, so it's really <laughs> I'm not sure how that would play out in any other part of the UK or certainly any other country um, where someone who's um, in charge of rights for all of their citizens um, is protesting against um, those for some. Um, so as very clearly laid out earlier by Daniel, the matter was considered, um, even though it was primary legislation from Westminster, nothing happened. Um, it was also slightly unfortunate timing because the regulations were laid in April 2020 just a couple of weeks before the advent of COVID and everything that came with it. Um, so things got a little bit lost there. Um, I'll give them that. <laughs> but um, what I can't um, give them is that it's now 2023. It's four and a bit years later, and we still don't have everything that we're supposed to have in the law. There's an effective, non-legal 10-week cutoff. And after that 10 weeks, people are still traveling over to England. Um, in the uh, recommendations made by CEDAW in their inquiry, they said that there were grave systemic breaches and the essence of those grave and systemic breaches were the travel. So it said in its report that travel was an untenable solution to people with, especially with um, fetal abnormalities, especially people for whom travel is really difficult and there's whole swathes of the population for whom it's just not possible. Um, my colleague Naomi and a couple of other uh, volunteers in Alliance for Choice have um, had to ramp up our services in assisting people since uh, 2020. And the majority of people that we end up helping now are people who fall through the net. So people in the most marginalised circumstances. A lot of people are refugees and asylum seekers in contingency accommodation, some of whom have been directed to Stanton, a rogue Christ pregnancy service first. Um, baffles me why they're legally allowed to exist, but um, who pretend to be an abortion service and then book them in for appointments, which they then cancel to delay them past the non-legal 10-week cutoff. Um, so often by the time they get to us, they might be past that 10 week cutoff. And so the only avenue is for us to try and access pills with um, NGOs outside of the statutory health system. Now we can no longer thankfully be criminalized for that here, but up until 2020, that was a life sentence was the threat. So, I mean, at least that's been lifted for us. That's the one thing. And it was our motivation for making sure that there were no um, criminal sanctions for activists and women who could get pregnant in there. Um, there have been a lot of uh, misuses of the Good Friday Agreement and all the mechanisms of government in order to block abortion. We've seen some of those demonstrated earlier. Whenever we were talking to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, who we find it easier to talk to than our own executive and our own assembly, um, as in the, uh, the channels of communication were more open, were more direct and more transparent. Never been one to be a fan of the Northern Ireland office, but in this particular instance, um, we found ourselves, and this is partly the question I was going to ask the people in the first section, where the um, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland office were asking us if we'd heard anything from the Department of Health because they couldn't get an answer. 
Now, I don't, I don't know how a department is allowed to run in that manner. We've also, we've met with uh, Sinn Féin because Michelle uh, O'Neill obviously used to be Minister for Health. And we've said, how did you get a response from the Department for, for, of Health? And she said, if it's something they don't like, they just won't answer you. So I don't know how that's effective health governance in any way. Um, we are supposed to have abortion services up to 24 weeks here for any health or medical reason. The only difference is up to 12 weeks it's supposed to be on request. So you don't need to give a reason. And past 12 to 24, it's a health or mental health reason where um, continuing the pregnancy would be more of a risk than having an abortion, which is always the case because continuing with the pregnancy to labour is 70 times more dangerous than um, having an early abortion. So um, we saw, and someone um, put it much better than me when they were interviewed uh, by, I think it was Mark Carruthers, and they said they are interpreting the Good Friday Agreement by the letter, but not by the spirit. So they're using um, the black and white wording of agreements and mechanisms to effectively block something that's completely against the spirit and intentions of the agreements that were made. Um, uh, so why? <laughs> There's two reasons why we still uh, have effective no access after 10 weeks. The first is bureaucratic and civil service processes in resistance. So there, there are a group of um, medical staff and providers, doctors, nurses, there's Doctors for Choice Northern Ireland, there's NIAC to the Northern Ireland Abortion and Contraception Task Force. Self-led, uh, self-directed, they ordered in the medicines in advance of the law being enacted. They wrote out protocols and systems for providing the service. And then as soon as the law came into effect in April 2020, tried to offer the services and were uh, threatened with legal action by the Assembly. Um, and by the, uh, at the time, Attorney General who was involved. There's a whole other presentation on the Attorney General and abortion, previous Attorney General. But um, yeah, it's, they were tried to be, the um, executive tried to block even those doctors, even providing in that very narrow window up to 10 weeks. Um, but we, there was a number of things that happened at the same time. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the British Medical Association, FCOG, can't remember what the acronym stands for, and, um, oh, and Doctors for Choice uh, all said this is, it's currently COVID. Nobody can travel over to England. Something very terrible is going to happen. And unfortunately, um, we were all right as um, someone who tried to access services over in England and whose flight was cancelled three times, presented to a hospital in the Northern Trust, was refused and then was brought into accident and emergency a week later when she'd taken an overdose. So it was one of those instances where we really didn't want to be right, but we just openly then said, look, we're just going to provide abortion services as an activist group with no medical training. Um, because there's, you know, this is completely untenable. We can't continue like this. And mysteriously, then they allowed the services to happen about a week later. Um, the cultural resistance is obviously the abortion stigma that's pervasive through institutions. So even though 66% of even DUP voters supported the change in abortion, um, it just takes one person in a high up place, in a health institution, in a health trust, in a government um, office, uh, to block something really significant. Um, so why does it matter? Uh, it's a human rights violation. Um, people, the health trusts every single day, every health trust in Northern Ireland is breaching its human rights obligation to people who need abortions. Every single day, the Department for Health in Northern Ireland is breaching someone's human rights in, their, in regard to their access to abortion. And the impact always, as usual, falls on the most marginalised. Um, so, like I said at the start, our bodies are messy and it's very hard to like regulate them in time to meet a very specific 10 week cutoff. The institutions are slow and process driven. And as we've seen, some of those processes are used manipulatively um, and people are still traveling and relying on activists. And much as we love helping people, we shouldn't have to. Um, a case in point is the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland asking us, a very small NGO, to ensure that all of our information on abortion was up to date because the Department of Health was refusing to publish any. 
Um, so the CEDAW inquiry was supposed to guard against the use of institutional mechanisms in blocking our rights, um, but what in effect happened, oh, sorry. What in effect happened um, is the doctors had to lead it themselves, the institutions didn't support them, in fact tried to block them. Um, what in fact happened was uh, a huge violation of rights, a huge impact on people's lives, particularly the most marginalised. Um, and despite our public support for change that could be evidenced through loads of research from um, amnesty polls to the Northern Ireland, um, what's it called again? Life yes, Life and Time Survey, thank you, um, is that there's still blockages from the Department of Health, um, that should say the Executive Office and the Assembly. So um, in light of all this, we still have to do lots of work for Alliance for Choice, who we hoped weren't going to have to do very much after 2020. Um, and I have a lot more I can say about the Bill of Rights and trying to get the statute in Northern Ireland. So thank you. Thank you, Emma. And uh, for taking us through the, the story of uh, what should have been a good news story, perhaps. Um, but we now turn to Claire Pearson's presentation. So Claire is a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Liverpool. She specializes in feminist politics, reproductive justice, and gender security. And she is currently working on a monograph focusing on gender and feminist politics in Northern Ireland after the Good Friday Agreement and leading a British Academy small grant on social movements and abortion rights in Malta. She is chair of the Feminist Studies Association of the UK and Ireland and a board member of Alliance for Choice Belfast. So over to you, Claire. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for inviting me today. It's been excellent and I've made lots of notes and things I want to, things that other speakers have said that I w would like to reflect on and think about. Um, and also, <laughs> I'm, I am writing a book on feminist and gender politics at the moment and Emma and I were on a panel a few months back where I presented some ideas around this and I walked away thinking you have to stop being so negative. So what I've tried to do today is present a slightly more balanced approach um, to some of my ideas, but you might see me stretching credulity a little bit to try and be more balanced. Um, so first of all, to say, I'm going to take a step back and think about you know, what is it we're doing um, when we think about restoring the assembly and building it in rights-based mechanisms, but from a slightly different perspective and from that of gender. And so I suppose the main thing to say is that when people consider power sharing, um, the mainstream, but in reality I'm talking about the mainstream, they're all, you know, the guys who write about consociationalism, they don't really speak about gender. They may mention it once or twice, but it's really more as a dismissive this doesn't really matter. And usually they do this alongside other identities like class and sexuality. And so it's really been up to the feminist power sharing literature to really begin digging into um, why is gender important in this system of governance. And so it began really with um, Siobhan Byrne and Alison McCulloch who talk about the fact that actually there's no real barrier in power sharing to women's representation, which is completely true, there isn't. But I think really what a lot of us wanted to do then was to take a step back and say, yeah, women can be descriptively represented under power sharing, but actually can they be substantively represented? So is gender a salient political identity? Because obviously women have ethno-national identities, but when they're representing themselves in power sharing, are they being represented um, both on ethno-national identity and gender, or more on the ethno-national side? And um, in my own work with Ronan Kennedy and Jennifer Thompson, we also talk about this idea of the hegemony of ethnicity, that the fact that the way that power sharing works um, it completely elides and invisibilizes other identities. So if you want to bring um, an issue onto the political agenda that is not primarily a sectarian or ethno-national issue, it must be created in that way in order to become politicized. So I, we can obviously give the issue of abortion or same-sex marriage, which have often been presented as 
very crudely sometimes by politicians, well, nationalists are more likely to support these issues than unionists, right? So they have to be sectarianized to actually be politicized and be on the political agenda. Um, and then some authors have gone even further to say really that power sharing entrenches male privilege and male dominance in political institutions. And that is really this, the feminist approach to power sharing. Now, when I was thinking about this, when Daniel talked about um, the what identity should, you know, how should we designate on identity? Um, I actually think the way we designate now is probably the most malleable because citizenship and passport are fixed legal entities. Um, political affiliation is more malleable. And OK, yes, it's very minimal, but we have seen some of our MLS designate as socialist or feminist. So I, th I think that allowing of a more malleable or, or nebulous political identity actually allows for the others to come through more strongly. Um, and it has allowed parties like Alliance and Green um, to build a base because those identities aren't as fixed. That, that's my attempting to be more positive about it. That I actually, when I revisited some of my older work, I was thinking about this. Um, Leip, Leipart, Leipart, I'm never sure how to pronounce his name, didn't design power sharing around ethno national um, identity. He designed it um, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland. These were, these were not ethno nationally divided societies. So the primacy of ethno nationalism isn't a fix. It's something we now associate with power sharing that we don't necessarily have to. Um, we can be slightly more maybe forward thinking about power sharing as bringing in other identities. Um, but that might be me being a little bit utopian. My political science colleagues don't always agree. Um, so if we apply this then to Northern Ireland, um, how does it, it, it it fixes quite well onto Northern Ireland. So quite often we talk about there's support um, for formal equality. Um, so there is support for the idea of equality between men and women, a liberal feminist idea of equal participation rather than perhaps a transformative idea. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But any time the idea of gender quotas have been brought up in the Northern Ireland Assembly, they've always been um, no, this is this is the line. So even though we may say there's some support for liberal ideas, when it comes to actually putting ideas in process, um, no, there is no will or want. Um, this then into issues that aren't primarily gendered or seen as gender issues. We see women not being found in those talks or in those agreements. So I did a basic content analysis of all the agreements from the Good Friday Agreement on very basic for words such as gender, women, and particular issues. And they don't come, they're not there. Occasionally you will get a reference to um, women um, should be able to participate in political life. And that's really about as far as it goes. So we see that coming out both in terms of the agreements that have come from out of the Good Friday Agreement, but also in the fact that we don't see gender balance on any of the forums to talk about history, legacy, culture, security, um, policing, etc. And then I have at the end, there, also with COVID, um, when the initial emergency leaders group was set up, again, there were no women um, on that leadership group initially, and it had to be the women's sector who really pushed for that. Um, don't need to go into this because Emma's already, um, but again, these blockages on issues such as same-sex marriage and abortion, again, if they can't be politicized in a sectarian way, they can also be blocked in a sectarian way. And I think also um, things such as the civic forum may not initially appear a gender issue, but we know women are more heavily represented in the community sector, so it very firmly is. The ease with which the civic forum has been completely, uh, has fallen off the agenda is a gender issue. OK, here's another bit of positive. But, OK, and I want to um, go to the work of one of my colleagues, Sean Hockey, in the Institute of Irish Studies um, in Liverpool, who's just produced a book on the Northern Ireland Assembly. It is actually a really great book. Um, and it's about this idea of how does the Assembly function and does it function? And Sean's conclusion is actually the executive is a mess, but the assembly, when it functions, isn't the worst legislature in the world. And I was taken by this 
um, particular, this was part of a survey where he asked MLAs, um, what groups do you represent? Who do you represent, um, first and foremost? And he then broke this down by nationalist, unionist, and other. And I think one of the interesting things is if you look at women's organisations, um, one in the graph is do not represent at all, and seven is this is of very great importance to me as a political representative. And what we can see is that women's organisations actually, MLS do believe themselves to be working for it, women's organisations. And there isn't that really any difference between political identity and whether you believe yourself to be working for women's organisation. Now, I have said to Sean, I think we might need to do some follow-up research here because what does an MLA believe a women's organisation is or does? Probably not an organisation like Alliance for Choice for some politicians, but p perhaps issues such as childcare, domestic violence, uh, welfare might be the issue. So we don't know because he didn't go into that much depth, but I do think it's interesting to point to the fact that most MLS do believe that women's organisations are important and that they are acting um, for those organisations. Um, descriptive representation is at an all-time high. It's above what we call critical mass in um, gender politics. Um, this is a bit of a reach. Party policies on abortion have shifted, um, and that has been the work of civil society and also what has happened at Westminster and through CEDAW. And I think this is an interesting one as well. Um, private members' bills um, coming from the Northern Ireland Assembly um, have been on gender issues and issues that cross community divides. So the Period Products Act, the Abortion Services Safe Access Bill, the Domestic Abuse Act. And I think that points to the importance of critical actors within the Assembly who are acting for gender that you can have some success um, going through different mechanisms. And then the final thing I just wanted to point to was um, uh, part of what I'm doing with the book is interviewing um, people who describe themselves either as working in women's organisations, as feminist actors, or as gender equality actors, about, I'm interested in this idea of starting to shape political space and change political space. And can spaces like the assembly, oh, okay. oh no, I'm, I think I'll be on time, yeah. Um, can spaces like the assembly be shifted and changed and shaped? And I'd say that's a really mixed account. So. Through the interviews, what really came away for me was that um, there has been so much work done to be included um, in policy making forums. And like what Emma says, where the Secretary of State are coming and asking for advice and asking for that is all the work that has been done up until now to really be included in that space. But what that space actually does and is. Um, and I describe this as sort of speaking different languages. The language that you might approach a politician or um, with about gender equality or gender equality goals might be completely different to how they understand it. And that goes back to that what I was talking about at the beginning about liberal feminism or formal equality, that we're actually working towards very, very different things and we have very, very different ideas of what it means to be equal. Um, and that came out a lot in the interviews. I'll not read these out, I'll let you read them. Um, that in some cases, there's often actually the limits of where policy can go has been very firmly decided in advance. And you're invited into a space to talk about those issues, but you can push this far and no further. And this far might not be very far. But again, you're there in the space, so you've legitimized the space. You've legitimized the policy, but you may not necessarily agree with how far the policy goes. So as someone who's working in women's rights or feminism, how much can you work with the assembly? How much can you work on policy if you can only go so far and no further? And then another thing that came out was really the, the sheer amount of evidence that has been collected um, around gender equality. And there are many people in this room who have uh, written reports and consultations. Um, all the evidence exists, but continually, and I can see some people smiling because they know, um, 
people are continually being asked to consult on something, provide more evidence that, you know, domestic violence is a problem, you know, provide more evidence that poverty is a problem. And all the evidence exists, and it's actually almost been used as a blocking mechanism to push things forward. Because if we constantly ask people to produce more research and to produce more evidence, we don't actually have to move forward with change. We can just keep consulting and consulting. And a lot of people talked about exhaustion and fatigue with constantly being asked to prove something that is completely obvious and the evidence already exists. So um, in terms of what could be done and what should be done, um, with, any, with any discussion about movement on any issue, we can't add gender on after or say once the assembly is back up and running, then we'll talk about gender or then we'll think about this. It has to be written in now. It has to be central to the discussion now. What it would look like is a really big discussion. I think I forgot to put Bill of Rights and writing things like reproductive health into Bill of Rights. But would it look like quota systems? Would it look like gender-friendly working policies? Would it look like reforming um, mechanisms which are supposed to be safeguarding so that they can't be used um, for issues that are not primarily ethno-national and how we would define that. Um, but again, yeah, and the Bill of Rights on there as well. And I think that's a discussion we should have is how do we centre gender within these processes and these mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, and I am full of admiration for anyone who can bring a positive uh, tone to these discussions. Um, our final speaker then is Leo Green. Uh, Leo is a PhD researcher with us here at Ulster. He is in the closing stages of a comparative study of the outworking of power sharing governance arrangements in two deeply divided societies, Northern Ireland and Bosnia-Herzegovina. His research focus tests the capacity of such arrangements to affect social transformative change. Leo is a former special advisor and political party manager at Stormont, who retired from party politics in 2013. So. <laughs> Thanks, thanks uh, Rory, and thanks as well for the invite to this. Uh, I can do positive for Northern Ireland. It's called Bosnia. So I'm just about to take you through a wee bit of a run on, on uh, some of the stuff. It's, I, I prepared a PowerPoint, but it's not about detail. It's just about, if you like, pictorial prompts for me just to run through the thing. Comparative study, it's all about just two situations you compare, trying to get the strengths, weaknesses, big things, and learn lessons from them. So. I focused then on basically the, the capacity of consociational power sharing to uh, affect social transformative change. Social transformative change in the study defined entirely in sync with what everybody's been discussing here, human rights protections, reconciliation, and, uh, and equality. Now, just to maybe kick off with something I hadn't planned to say, but just having listened to all the other stuff earlier on, uh, the power sharing construct we have in Northern Ireland and in Bosnia didn't fall out of the sky. It's a, pres a prescription model for conflict, or countries emerging from conflict. It emerged in the late 60s. Arnold Leifert has already been mentioned in a previous presentation. And he has four components in it. He has the government, the grand coalition, the collection of individ or indiv or representatives of the primary ethnic or segmental parties. Then he has some form of segmental autonom autonomy for them. Proportionality, the guarantee that all sections are represented in the, in the institutions and the thing. And the veto, and the veto's there for a reason, and everybody hits the veto, but it's there as a safeguard. And uh, you know, the, the thing is, you could be in a government and not have power. You could be a minority person or a minority group within a government and be outvoted and everything. The veto's there for, for a reason. It's been abused, yes, and it's the same in Bosnia, it's sir. The, I want to just shoot through some different things, maybe not in a very linear form, but uh, just to give people, who are these guys? These are the guys that signed the Dayton Peace Agreement. The Dayton War, or the, the Dayton War, the Bosnia War, or you should maybe more describe it as the war in Bosnia. These are outsiders. These are the people who led the armies that fought the Bosnian War, and they eventually signed the Peace Agreement. 
So in 1992 to 1995, all-out war, and it, it, it emerged, if you like, or it grew from the, the collapse of Yugoslavia and, uh, if you like, the, the aspirations mainly of the Serbs to take control of the region. And um, anyway, it was, compared to Northern Ireland, three-year war, 100,000 dead, countless numbers of people injured, infrastructural damage all around, about 20,000 women uh, just in terms of some of the stuff that's been mentioned earlier on, uh, raped or sub subjected to other forms of, of violence. You had uh, massive sort of uh, ethnic cleansing that went on in the area. And uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement was, if you think back of Northern Ireland, of a conflict of about 30 years, and during the course of it, there was different initiatives. And we end up with an initiative, the Good Friday Agreement, very much like some of the things that went on before. Dayton's the same. Over three years and about five attempts at peace agreements, and that ended up with something similar from all the other ones. What was the difference? The difference was in terms of the map, and, uh, and it all makes you wonder. Every picture tells a story in this. What do you see in that picture? Three men. The Serb, the, yeah, he's uh, the Croat and the, the Bosniak. And uh, they represent three groups. Northern Ireland is a sort of a two-way split. Bosnia is three. You have a population of about four, four million pe people. 50% of them are Bosniak. Uh, about 30% are Serb. 20, 50 or whatever, 20% are Croat. And then there's what they call, is, nobody likes to call the others. There's, there's a lot of other minority groups there. And uh, as I said earlier on, these, these three guys signed the agreement. Do they look happy? That's on the day they signed the agreement. No, it didn't look happy. The Bosnian agreement was foisted upon them. The Serbs at one stage were winning the war. The Americans and NATO bombed them, and they started to lose the war. And they come back to the negotiating table and they write a letter solution. They're not, there, they're not, they're not sitting there smiling. They're, none of them were happy with the outcome. They didn't go out and sell it. Arguably, it wasn't sold very well in Northern Ireland either. But, uh, but as has been mentioned earlier on, peace negotiations and peace agreements, man, 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 war, man, man, man. So the, this is what it was all about. It was about the area of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you can see there just the way it's all split up. You can think of that. The red is the sort of Serb, and uh, the blue is, and some of these others are the Croat. The Croat's the blue, the, the Bosniak Croat is they're all split. There's a couple of them mixed, the, the areas within it. But what happened actually at, at Bosnia was before the war, it was a relatively mixed community. Once the war took place, it was, it become a very, um, as a result of the genocide and the ethnic cleansing and on, and the reason I was saying earlier on about the peace agreements, they started off the first peace agreement starting to talk about territory and how many people were in one area. And what did that do? That encouraged the people who were fighting the war to grab territory and ethnically cleanse the territory because you know, the next time you go back to the negotiation, what are you going to be said? What territories have you got? And so gradually, the battle was to constantly, incrementally build the territory that people had so they went into the negotiation. Charles Bilt, uh, one of the co-conveners of the Dayton Peace Agreement, he writes a book about it. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating when you think that these guys are all brought over to America, to Dayton, Ohio, for peace agreement negotiations. And what are they talking about? Are they talking about human rights? Are they talking about welfare of people? Are they talking about education? Are they talking about governmental structure? <clears throat> no. They're sitting looking at a map. They're quite literally sitting in a room day after day looking at a map, and they're saying, no, I want that bit. No, no, I want that bit. And that's the way it went on. And, uh, so it's all about wars, and, wars, not all wars, but inevitably it's about territory. It wasn't about this. The Bosnian, this is a sort of, a, if you like, a, a description of the levels of government and the institutional structure in Bosnia. And if you think Northern Ireland is complicated, have a look at that. Other representations, more or less, that's a simplified version. Bosnia is a, it's been described as an institutional monster. Frankenstein state. Uh, all sorts of things, but you can see what it actually does is that the country was effectively partitioned. You ended up with two entities, the Republic of Serbska, which is largely Serb, the Federation, 
which takes in the Croat territories and the Bosniak territories. And this was a bit more like Stormont. Well, very much, fairly straightforward, mainly because the vast majority of the population are Serb. Over here, it's not so, so clear. What was set up at the very start was a tripartite presidency. So there would be three presidents in the, in the one presidency that rotate the chair, a Bosnian, a Croat, and a Serb. And, uh, and there's an idea for Northern Ireland, three first ministers, a unionist, a nationalist, and the only. Anyway, the, what they ended up was a, a three, the first thing they did with the three <laughs> tripart presidency was to start to strip the powers out of the, head, the heads of state and devolve them down. So you have this notional power sharing at the top, and you start to devolve the powers down. First of all, you devolve them over to the Republic of Serbia. That's not going to do too much for power sharing. And here you devolve them into their own institutions and then down to the cantons. The cantons are very powerful. And uh, so the whole idea of power sharing becomes immediately deconstructed. Very interesting when you think of the, the, the role of the courts in all of this. Uh, uh, one of the things that happened a few years after the Dayton Peace Agreement was the consociational principles which were supposed to be applied in the two entities were not being applied. At the top, yes, one, one, one. In here it was different, in that it was different. There was a case taken to the European Court. They instructed, they had to bend to these entities to apply the power sharing principles within their different entities. And it's been a battle like that ever since. The, just in terms of outworking, and you'll, you, you read all of them things, it's, it's Northern Ireland, but it's Bosnia. It's institutional dysfunction, immobilism, gridlock, and corruption, fluctuating political stability, societal polarization, regressive, regressive perspectives, and key equality issues and the lack of political agreement on legacy issues. I have, I have a long, long, much longer list of two different chapters, one in Bosnia and one in Northern Ireland. You could swap them over to change the names. You can narrate the same thing twice. And, uh, and incidentally, just in terms of that, one of, one of the things that, uh, well, it was said earlier on about the, the, the debt and peace agreement, and it was much the same in Northern Ireland. The, the negotiations, the politicians, were not thinking about 20 years up the road. They weren't thinking about rights. They weren't thinking about institutions. Nobody was talking about vetoes. The word consociation was never mentioned. And uh, so you ended up with, well, all these things are taken from, this wasn't my observations. These are all taken from various reports about the outworking of consociationism in Bosnia. In the North, it's the same. If you look at the, the, the peace monitoring reports and uh, and some reports from the, from the EU, you get all the same stuff. There's, it's, there's just, there's, there's, there's no point in sort of laboring the point that's there for everybody to see. Legacy, all, incidentally, the, if, if you compare issues that are relevant in Bosnia and in Northern Ireland, it, it's quite amazing. Identity is a big thing, as you can see. The identity code Bosnia serve thing was a big thing. And in Northern Ireland, it's a big thing. Flags are important. Yeah, parades are important. Legacy issues and reconciliation. Who's this guy? This is the Colleen Mansa statue in Sarajevo. One of the, the, the big atrocities carried out during the, Serb, uh, the, the war in Bosnia was the massacre at Srebrenica. 8,000 men were executed, taken out of a, what was, should have been a safe zone guarded by the UN and uh, peacekeepers, and the Serbs took them all out. They separated the the men from the rest of their families, the men and the boys from the rest of their families, marched them out into the countryside and slaughtered them, chased them up into the hills and hunted them. This guy, this guy was forced to call up into the hills for his son to come down. Oh my God, three minutes, I had to shoot away from this. Uh, what I'm trying to give it here is a sense of a backdrop to, to the resolution of issues. This big issue is about genocide. One of the things that when it comes up in Bosnia, there's a, there's a law against genocide denial. The Serbs don't accept that this was genocide. And it has actually thrown the, the country into disarray in terms of some of the decisions. This is an interesting thing of just a shoot through it for Northern Ireland. This is a school in Bosnia. This is education. This is a, 
What they call it is a two schools under one roof. This is the Croat school. This is the, the Bosniak school, and it's in the it's in the federation. This is a grand section of the school funded by Croatia. This is funded by the, the federation. It used to be was a wire a wire fence down here. The kids went down there, went in there, didn't talk to each other. Now at least they talk to each other. Throwing this out just as a wee idea that in Northern Ireland with this shared campus, yeah, big deal. This is a nonsense. The European court is ruling against this thing. And, uh, and yet we trump this idea of bringing kids together in a shared campus as opposed to in an integrated school. It's uh, crazy stuff, in my view, anyway. European court, the other thing just about rights and relevant to all of this is the European court the European court's sick telling Bosnia to, to get up and do things better. One of the things earlier on, there's a famous case about the, who can be president and who can't be president. Serdic and Vinci, the Euro European court decided 15 years ago that the, the law which precludes anybody who's not a Serb, a Croat, or a Bosnian standing for the president is wrong and needs to be changed. It is yet to be changed. The institutions operate in Bosnia ignoring the political, or uh, the the courts. So it's, it's just a wee issue about human rights and the, the problems of enforceability. One particular pressure point on, on all of this is Bosnia is looking to join NATO and they're looking to join the EU. Now, all of that may change. Two years ago, if I'd have been given this presentation, I would have been saying, Northern Ireland, you can guarantee the peace. In Bosnia, it's a bit more problematic, but you can guarantee the peace. You wouldn't bet on it now. You wouldn't bet on it now because of the war in Ukraine and all this, the Serbs have allied, aligned themselves sort of a, with Russia, so to speak. But in any case, the, the pressure point in Bosnia to change, to have human rights, to legislate for different things, is coming on them from Europe and also supposedly from, from NATO. Although, Republic of Serbska, <laughs> they're going cold on the idea of joining NATO. So the, it's problematic in, uh, in all of this. And, uh, I think that's, that's much of what I have to say. All of them, what I'm trying to do is to paint a context, a background context that we can't forget. That these, these agreements were specially constructed for societies emerging from conflict. And the last thing I just want to talk about for a couple of seconds, right, is this concept of deeply divided societies. Northern Ireland is a deeply divided society, and so is Bosnia. It isn't just a description. It's not just something you would say like big or small. It's, yeah, it's true, but you have to understand that um, in terms of working out solutions, we have to factor it in. What is it? It's a society that has segmental divisions. That's one thing. So both of these countries classify there. The other thing about them, it's the political dynamic that goes on with it. Everything is played out through the lens of the constitutional outstanding questions. The constitutional battleground sort of dogs everything. And uh, so that's, that's the problem. And until we get to the situation where we start to undermine the dynamics within deeply divided societies, we're doomed to have much of the same. The same. That's why I was major on the issue of schools, starting the schools. Lastly, probably the most comforting thing that I heard when, and my, my visit to Bosnia and Herzegovina was two Master students at one of the universities helping me with translations, and uh, I was speaking to them about different things, and both of them had a story to tell about the conflict. One a young woman was born in a hospital in Sarajevo. At the time, she was being delivered to the place the hospital was bombed. The other fella, his father had died in Srebrenica, and, uh, and they never mentioned it until uh, my last night there, and uh, the great thing about them was they talked about the past and the need to get over it. And the need to move on and the need to stop hearing. In Bosnian schools, if you ask about the conflict, they tell you to go home and ask your parents. The last thing young people need is to hear the conflict through the, the experience of their parents. In Northern Ireland, the university organized a peace summit not so long ago. Young people were at it and I read, I was not at it, I read the commentary on it in the Irish Times. A few, ten, a few days later, and it was exactly the same sentiment from the younger people expressing this idea that, look, we need to move on. Yeah, we can't forget the conflict. We have to learn from it, but we still need to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to stay there? Um, huh? and if, uh, Claire, you want to
to rejoin us. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Leo. And always important to take a step back and look at how other societies uh, have similar travail and challenges and how they respond. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Leo. And thank you to our, all of our speakers for keeping uh, to time, Leo, more or less to time. Mm -hmm. And um, so it gives us a good 20 minutes or so, 23 minutes even before five o'clock. Uh, so questions, observations, Daniel. Um, at the moment, but I suppose my question was really to Claire on the optimism <laughs> front. Um, I think the main reason to be optimistic is that the, in most issues anyway, not quite everything, but in most issues anyway, the opponents of rights and equality are now a minority. Mm. I think the paradox we face, relevant to the discussions today, is that the very safeguards that were embedded in the agreements have been flipped and they're actually giving disproportionate power to the opponents of rights and equality rather than um, performing their, existed, their, their envisaged functions of actually providing rights-based safeguards. So I was wondering if your observations on that. Claire, do you want to okay. Yeah, and I think, I suppose that's, the power of feminist work, right? Because it's highlighted this so clearly that you can't see everything through one lens. We have to look at things in a more pluralistic way, right? We can't sectarianize everything. And I think that is the importance of that. But yeah, you're completely right. These people are in a minority but have a majority voice. But that would be part of that renegotiation. I think see now the fact that we can see it is the most important thing to renegotiate it, right? That we know where we sit with it. I don't know, Emma, if you wanted to. Yeah, please. Mm. Um, the Good Friday Agreement was written in a very different time. And I think, um, you know, even just amongst all my friends, the amount of people who are from multiple generations of mixed, you know, in a Northern Ireland version of that. Um, and that is not reflected adequately in the systems and mechanisms of government. It just isn't. It's not reflected adequately even in the provision of integrated schools. There are hundreds, uh, thousands more people who want those properly integrated place, places that are even available. And it's that minority voice that is that is keeping us back. Um, I, I think, going back to more i mean there's lots of controversy around uh civil assemblies but i know they were mentioned earlier um, my biggest issue with the civil assembly in ireland and abortion was that they didn't actually enact the law that the civil assembly asked for <laughs> anyway um but i think those uh uh increase in democracies and if an if it is it would ensure more uh, women's voices, queer voices, working class voices, voices of people that don't own farms, for instance, um, would be more easily heard in, in and represented in powerful places. So uh, I, I think that's a huge factor. Um, I also think um, the preparation for a united Ireland is happening whether people like it or not. Um, it just is. We don't know when that's going to happen, not that even when a border poll is going to happen, but there are um, women's committees on the Shared Islands project, there's community and civic forums there, and um, I sort of feel like now we're in a time where there's a bit of a last sting of a die and be vibe happening, um, but that could still be really dangerous for rights, and we still have to guard against that. Um, Leo, did you want to comment on Daniel's question? If you can come to the mic, just uh, it was a general question, so let well, everyone. I just want to comment on that last part. There is, for me anyway, there is demographic changes driving a new dynamic within Ireland, and obviously we're heading somewhere new. And I think the task, of the most comfort, one of the most comforting things I was reminded of today, because when you're lacking your studies, you do get depressed. <laughs> Patricia mentioned it was that there's 100 civic society or 200 civic society groups. That's powerful. There's not anything like that in Bosnia. But uh, just generally speaking, I think that the, 
some of the stuff that goes on, in the, it's, it's actually good to see power sharing at council level. I think that's, that's a great thing. The veto issue, one of the things I wanted just to say about the veto issue was that uh, the European Court has taken a lot of decisions around the very, uh, based their judgments on the fact that there's a lot of strangeness about the consociational arrangement, which was okay at the time. But we're 25, 30 years on, and that needs to be addressed. I think we need to go back to the drawing board. And I do think that we need to do that now. I would like to see us to get a significant advance in rights before we even start talking about border. Thank you for that. And then over here, and then, oh, yeah. Okay, so you first. Just to build on the previous question the answers given. So um, I think we have made some real leaps and bounds forward, even just in the last 10 years, in terms of some legislative gains and also changes in hearts and minds in society. A lot of that has been, despite all the different vetoes and bureaucracies that we face here, but I, I, I work for Cara Friends, one of the LGBT charities, and we're very blessed here to have you know a lot of synergy and cooperation between different uh, Section 75 groups and civil society groups, like the LGBT sector and the women's sector. But I'm, I, and I, I do think that the, the last kick of a dying horse thing to do with the reactionaries and whatnot has some merit, but we're seeing a real rapid rise of far-right and fascistic politics that's making a re-emergence. We're seeing attacks on like migrant uh, detention centers. We're seeing new like LGB groups forming that are anti-trans. We're seeing some uh, like w supposedly women's groups that are very anti-trans as well, in some cases quite anti-feminist as well. So I wonder about, I, it, my question in part is that we're very lucky to have all this uh, synergy and collaboration between Section 75 groups. I wonder how much of that is because we've faced historic enemies in the same way, the same way groups that are, like the DUP, for example, that have opposed one group's rights have opposed the others. And, there, and we've been, unlike in England, where they had abortion come in and then they had, um, so, oh well, so I assume that marriage doesn't actually apply because I was here first. But you see what I'm driving towards is that as that sort of changes, and new opponents and new movements and new tactics of our opponents arise, how do we keep things together in that sort of sense? Because I'm, I used to think like, oh well, they're they're dying out and they're we're, we're winning, and I'm actually not quite worried. So the question, I suppose, is how do we rise to these new challenges that are more of like a far right fascistic and modern problem? Thank you, and we'll take your question and then let the panelists respond to both. It's kind of thematically related to that work really well. Um, it's it's kind of for me working on the question I was thinking of in the last set of presentations. Um, but specifically, I noticed on, on her presentation, she mentioned some pieces of legislation that passed just at the very, very last day of the previous, um, the, the last legislative that we had, so March 22, and it was around safe access zones and, and safe leave for domestic abuse victims and period cover. And Leaving aside that some of those are still kind of gummed up in the works, right? The, a couple of weeks later, we had an election, and we, the people of Northern Ireland, voted the three MLAs who brought those pieces of legislation out. They're gone, right? So, what is it about us? And I know there's something there that we've changed before that around reducing the number of MLAs. So, there's an institutional aspect there, too. Mm -hmm. But what is it about us that the politics, so the thing that usually goes to the voting group, or the thing that happens at the assembly, that oftentimes we don't know what even goes on, we're not paying full attention to it. Um, you know, I, like this is probably a little personal anecdote. I was working in the women's sector, and not too long ago I was in a meeting in which a person um, expressed forcefully the opinion that the reason the, the last executive collapse happened was about the Irish language and not our vagina. Like how is it that we're separating the work that we do, the things we believe in, the things we care about, from politics? Why are we putting politics in this place over there that's not for us to think about and maybe mean that we can move in a quite a regressive way and go into the voting group away from the things that we care about? Um, and is that, you know, I don't know how to put it in that unique in Northern Ireland, but like um, the next previous questioner, I, I'm afraid of the direction of travel uh, because we don't seem to go to our beliefs. <laughs> Thank you. Two great questions, and maybe we'll take them in the uh, take our speakers in the order in which they presented. So, Emma, do you want to kick us off? Um, uh, uh, 
there's a there's a a huge amount of work going into uh, digital security and digital safety at the minute um, for a abortion activists globally. And that's because um, it's not just disinformation, misinformation and astroturfing of feminist organi pretend feminist organisations to try and usurp the real feminist movement that's happening. Um, they're also trying to block our information. So there's certain... Alliance for Choice website doesn't work when you're in Stormont. It's blocked. There are, and that's a small example, but um, uh, Facebook constantly have us on review uh, or we're shadow banned. We're shadow banned at the minute. So like two people put, see a post that three years ago, 10,000 people would have seen. Um, and that's not a Northern Ireland problem. That's a global problem. And there's a really good ar article in uh, uh, Democracy Now!, about where those funds are coming from and a lot of it's old Christian right surprise surprise money from within Europe but a lot of it's from uh, Russia and America as well. My uh, hope, <laughs> inspired by Claire, in all of this is when we do have uh, reactionary, for instance when Posey Parker was in Northern Ireland, the people that gave her a platform were DUP people, Britain first and TUV and um, the real <laughs> feminist organisations and LGBT organisations far, far outnumbered those people by multiples of 100, not multiples of 10. So I think their voice online is louder than their voice in real life, so that's one thing. Um, unfortunately, um, it, we're still de facto ruled by Westminster, and Westminster is reacting very um, strongly to those f fascist currents. I mean... I don't want to go all out and say they're a fascist government, but someone else can in the room if they want to. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, but I, I think our BAM and our SALV is that we already have what you're talking about, those strengths and coalitions between civil society groups. We still have, unlike America, a really strong um, union kind of representation across the island, and the unions have worked really well with all of those other um, civic actors. Um, I think the one thing that makes me afraid is poverty because it's much harder for people to protest when they don't have anything to eat and they can't clothe their kids um, and education falls when poverty... Things that are being done to schools at the minute is, is appalling. So um, I have hope, I have not hope and I don't think it's anything on, for once in this conversation to do with the organisation of the Assembly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Claire. Yeah. Um, yeah, I live in England now, so <laughs> this is why I've gone Pollyanna today, I think, because I've come back to somewhere that's better, um, because it's awful, yeah. Um, okay, so the first thing, I don't know, yeah, I, the, the biggest group or the biggest political party rise is the Alliance Party. So, yes, I see what you're saying about those people being voted out, but actually, then if I want to go to the other side, it's actually there is a rise in groups of people who don't want to be affiliated to a particular identity. So maybe if we hold on to something, it's the rise of... And you might think whatever you think. Yes, Fiona, I can see your face about the Alliance Party. But it is generally people mostly people who may not want to go down the hard line route um, or the Green Party and rises in um, so that would be one thing I'd say there is a plural a rise in plurality of identity or a rise in plurality of people who don't want to necessarily ascribe themselves to one identity or the other um, whether what that means though when they go in privately to vote but they in surveys, they will say they don't want to ascribe to one identity. Um, the other thing I'd say is, um, I think, if you compare things like the history of the women's movement in England with Ireland, that idea of not dealing with difference is really big in the women. You know, the women's movement in England was very, quite homogenous. Um, and so we have that legacy of being able to think about difference within identities. Um, but I don't think that is room for complacency. I do think, um, you know, it's not the rhetoric here in comparison to the rhetoric in England is very, very, very different, but it can easily travel. Ideas travel. Um, and I think they travel in different ways, but they, I, I think in comparison there is a much more um, 
plurality in movement here and how people organise than there is in England. And it's in particular how women's groups and feminist groups um, organise is quite different. And there are some amazing groups that are much more plural in England, but it is quite, I suppose, maybe a middle class white feminist movement. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. <coughs> Just on, on the very last point you made about why people walk into a uh, polling station and vote for some of the parties. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you see, if you look at the peace agreements, the peace agreements are premised on privileging the ethnic groups. So what happened after the Great Friday Agreement? The Great Friday Agreement, the two champions of it, if you like, the two key people who were John Hume and David Trimble. What happened to the SDLP and the Ulster Unionists? They went on the slide, and Sinn Féin and DUP overtook. Same thing happened in Bosnia. And the reason it happens is because the constitutional question is not really solved. Great Friday Agreement is described as a, a, as a massive compromise, historic compromise. Oh, it kicked the constitutional question up the road, and now we have it. So all, all the politicians have to do after the Great Friday Agreement is come out with the ethnic drumbeat, and people come to them. Because this thing that they call in political science ethnic tri tribune voting, where people vote for the party who thinks they will repre represent their interest the strongest. So you, you might think the party's nonsense, but on this big constitutional question, because the zero-sum politics problem in Northern Ireland is heading towards its biggest test. We all talk about there shouldn't be zero-sum politics, but a border poll is zero-sum politics at its ultimate. And that's where the road is headed. So all the politicians have to do. Ian Paisley got away with it for years where he was campaigning every election with keep Sinn Féin out. And then he went in. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so they, they've all learned from that. I, I thought it very interesting that Sinn Féin took a position there recently. I don't think they actually announced it, but it, it crept into their language. Several years ago, Sinn Féin were describing the first and deputy first ministers as joint and co-equal first ministers. Not anymore. Now I wonder why that happened. They're now talking about, we'll be the first minister and the DUP need to come in as deputy first minister. It's all about symbolism, but it works, you see. It gets some votes, and that's, that's the thing. So it's, it's a never-ending cycle. I just think it, uh, that's where it is. Thank you very much. Um, we are getting close to the hour, so I am going to ask Daniel or Patricia if either of you or both of you would like to say any last words as co conveners. Okay. Uh, um, I well, I want to say, first of all, thank you to all our panelists. It's been very stimulating and exciting. There's hope for us all yet. Um, big thank you to the uh, Transitional Justice center to the um, uh, university itself, obviously to us, the Equality Coalition, and to the um, Center for Ident uh, Gender, Justice and Gender Justice and Security, isn't that it? Yes. Thank you. Um, we are on a journey. I mean, it strikes me in all I've heard today that um, nobody liked our peace agreement. It's the nature of a negotiation that you end up with a deal that doesn't satisfy everybody. In terms of ours, I think nobody really was satisfied. Everybody had an element of it that they had a problem with. But um, you have to pay credit to the people in the society that they were prepared to accept what they didn't particularly like and vote in large numbers for it. Um, but, you know... Um, I suppose the difference between us and, and you know, Bosnia, Herzegovina, throughout our conflict and in the absence of something like um, constituency politics, civil society organisations, women's groups, community groups filled that void and played, I think, a very significant role in trying to peace build and hoped that we were going to play a very significant role after the peace agreement. Uh, but my God, the rows we've had with the political system. I can think of um, the year 2010, a full year spent in a room 
uh, with all of the political parties and the um, two unionist parties in particular arguing uh, that we did not need social and economic rights in a Bill of Rights because that was the responsibility of the politicians and the people elected the politicians and the politicians would deliver on that and then voted against every aspect of the rights that we had put into the big draft Bill of Rights and they voted against them at a time when their own constituents in the Donegal Road, and we challenged them on this, still had outside toilets, but they didn't care because we're the elected politicians, we will do what's right, and they haven't done what's right. So um, the period of time in the first decade when civil society was challenging in a bigger way than it's challenging now. Now we're challenging in a different way, but we're not, and, and there's more of us, I think, but we're not challenging collectively in quite the way we did before. Um, hence the absence of forums, etc., civic forums or assemblies. And we need to start doing that again because, look, this thing's not working properly. It can be made to work. Um, but we are the voice. We are the people who make the peace process work. And I think that's where we've got to take our role in all of this a lot more seriously and understand that, you know, we do have power. And in terms of women, um, you know, no matter what the UK government says, no matter that it argues there was no conflict, so therefore there will be no work done around you and, you know, 13... <laughs> Come on, don't start me. <laughs> there was no conflict there. Um, no matter what they say, I think we've got the right frameworks and I think we've already built uh, a really good framework for civil society to move this all forward. This is all part of it. So thank you to everybody who, who's taken part today and to the organisers for making it happen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia, and just let me echo all of Patricia's thanks, uh, particularly thanks to my colleagues Rachel Rankin and Siobhan Wills who had to step in to help out with some things at the last instant. Uh, just to mention, and I think Siobhan referred to this, the Den Gender Justice and Security Hub uh, has kindly supported this event and is supporting another event uh, later in the autumn. And the Gender Justice and Security Hub has a mission to ask us, uh, those people participating in it, to imagine what a radically transformed future would look like. Uh, one radically transformed future, or maybe not so radically transformed future, uh, would be, of course, a united Ireland. And in, on that note, I would say, I would remind you that we have a second seminar in this mini-series with the Equality Coalition, uh, which will be on the 15th of November, again on the Belfast campus, uh, in a different room, so pay attention when you get your guidance, uh, on specifically imagining how minority rights and women's rights would be protected or could be protected in a united Ireland. Uh, so I hope to see many of you back on the 15th of November for that event. Um, Thank you, by the way, to the participants who have given up their Friday afternoon right up until 5 o'clock uh, to come along and have a really engaged conversation. Uh, so applaud it to you. And just one final round of applause for our speakers and chairs today. <laughs>